coming up next on NMZ Live TV. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who has raised to life. Up next on NMZ Live TV. we welcome you to our virtual service that has been pre-recorded to air at this time from the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church where we as a people though we are not gathered physically we are gathered spiritually and we are as one we come together to worship our Lord the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Rome the fifth chapter he says where sin increased grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and as we begin this service this morning we hear from the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church we want you to join in with us as we sing the words will be on your screens as we sing of this grace that the apostle paul wrote of this marvelous grace of our loving lord grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt it says yonder on calvary's mount on four there where the blood of the lamb was spilled grace grace god's grace grace that is greater together.
today we thank you for this wonderful this matchless grace this grace Lord that far exceeds all of our sin and we thank you Lord that you willingly came to pay the price to extend grace to us and oh we bless your name today Lord and we pray for those who are watching right now father they may not know you but when pastor Sharice comes with the word Lord we ask that life would be given so that they would freely receive this grace this infinite grace this matchless grace that is beyond all that we can ever hope or think and so today we bless you Lord and we thank you Lord for the cross the fact Lord that you paid a price that we could not pay and for those of us who believe we say Jesus keep us near your cross oh near the cross father be your glory ever Till our raptured souls shall find rest at your feet. We praise you, we bless you. Amen and amen and amen. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me Free to all. Free to all. A healing stream. A healing stream. And it flows from Calvary's mountain. It flows from Calvary's mountain. Come on, everyone, say in the cross, say in. Till I find rest beyond the river. Come on, everyone, say in the cross. Somebody go ahead and give God praise right now. Lift that hand wherever you are. Praise the name of Jesus, everybody. We're going to bless the Lord wherever we are right now. is a good time to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Come on, everybody. Let's get in this atmosphere of praise as we bless him. Come on. One, two, three.
Come on, everybody, we praise him. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody, come bless the Lord.
true that you are thinking of me How you love me It's amazing Who am I say Who am I that you are my good Oh, 
What need, oh what needless pain we bear Because we do not Coming as flesh, and these are the days, and these are the days of the servant David. Oh, rebuilding the temple of praise. Oh, and these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as white in the world. Fields are as white in the world, and we are the laborers. 
that we serve a God who in the midst of COVID-19 we still can honor him worship him and praise him and so we bless the Lord today and just as we before we move on we just want to invite you at this time just to bow as we prepare to pray over this offering that you have set aside so when we come back together we know that some of you have inquired and you have placed 
and you have looked in the WhatsApp group and you have found out how you can deal with your tithes and offering. But before you even deposit it to the account, we're going to ask that you take your tithing envelope. We're going to ask that you take your wallet as you just raise them to God in worship as we pray for this tithe and this offering. Father, we just thank you right now. We bless you and we praise you. We know that you are worthy and you have blessed us. And so, Lord, we have set aside what we are going to honor you with. Because we know, Lord, that when we put you first in our finances, you said that men will give back into our bosoms. And so we just bless your name. We praise your name. We honor and glorify your name today for this tithe and this offering that your people have set aside for you. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time right now, we just take a moment as we prepare to receive the word today. Our speaker this morning is no stranger to us here at New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. But for those who might be watching this program, our speaker, an educator by profession, a mother, but more importantly, a child of the King. One who has gone to the cross and one who has gone to that place where she allowed Jesus full control of her life. And our speaker today is none other than the pastor of our women's ministry, Pastor Sharice Evans. As we prepare to receive the word, the praise team returns as they minister in song. And following the praise team, our speaker will be Pastor Sharice Evans.
lift your voice and say praise, praise. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We're going to start at verse 28. And it reads, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestinated, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also make it intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm sure that the Lord is able to add his richest blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most precious word. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word on today. Father, we ask, O oh God, that you would bless this word. Bless the listeners, O oh God. Father, may change and transformation come about as a result of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For a short moment, I want to speak from the topic, all things will work for our good. I want you to look at that person that's next to you in your home or the person on the praise team that's next to you and say to them, all things will work for our good. Hallelujah. The scripture that was read from the book of Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, is one of the most popular scripture verses that everyone loves to quote. Many times this verse is taken or quoted out of context. Many individuals are of the opinion that the moment they accept God's plan of salvation, life changes for the better, and only good things will happen in their lives. Yes, life does change for the better. You are no longer a part of the kingdom of darkness. Colossians 1 and 3 says, Who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. First Peter 2 and 9 says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, Life does change for the better as it relates to us no longer heading to a Christless hell. Many think that after accepting God's plan of salvation, life would be hunky-dory because of Romans 8.28. However, many fail to read the preceding verses found in the same chapter. Verse 18 of the same chapter says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So in this verse, Paul lets us know that as believers, we will experience suffering. In fact, in 1 Peter 4 verses 1 and 2 it says, For as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that suffered in the flesh had ceased from sinning. The Living Bible puts it this way. Since Christ suffered and underwent pain, you must have the same attitude he did. You must be ready to suffer too. For remember, when your body suffer, sin loses its power. And you won't be spending the rest of your life chasing after evil desires, but will be anxious to do the will of God. Verses 12 and 13 of the same chapter says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, in as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Verse 16 says, Yet, if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God 
on this behalf. So having this clear understanding that suffering, trials, tribulation, or persecution is a part of the believer's life, we can understand and appreciate what Romans 8.28 says in this context. So this verse can't be read in isolation. Romans 8.28 gives us the assurance that even though we as believers, and notice I said believers, because the assurance of Romans 8.28 is not for everyone. And I'll explain what I mean as I continue in this message. Paul begins Romans 8.28 with the phrase, and we know. What the apostle Paul is saying, in other words, is that in the midst of suffering or seasons of difficulty, this God that we serve has a proven track record of causing all things to work together for our good. So when Paul mentions this phrase, and we know, it means to have seen or perceived, hence to know. I believe the apostle Paul is giving witness of what he has seen God do in his own personal life, as well as in the lives of others who have passed and gone before him. When Paul says, and we know, I believe he is not only recalling his own past experience of suffering, but he's recalling the experience of others. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 28, Paul talks about his suffering as a believer. He says, I've worked much harder because being in prison more frequently, being flogged more severely, and being exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in dangers from Gentiles, in dangers in the city, in dangers in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Another example that Paul may be including in his phrase, and we know, is the patriarch Joseph, who in the midst of suffering, watched God cause all of his challenges to work together for his good. The phrase work together means God arranges our circumstances, causing all things to work together for good to us. In other words, God causes our bad situations to cooperate with the purpose for which God has for our lives to bring about his ultimate good. Hallelujah. Let me say that again. God causes our bad situations to cooperate with the purpose for which God has for our lives to bring about his ultimate good. When I use the term cooperate, that word means to work jointly toward the same end. Let me give you an example using some of my students to bring clarity. Normally in the classroom, we would have what we call cooperative learning groups, where the children are grouped and each of them are given assignment. But there is one goal. Each class needs to accomplish the assignment to receive that A. But you know, all of them have different personalities. And there is one, there's always one person in the group who can't get along with everybody else and want things to go their way. And the, the children would summon me and I would go and I would say, guess what? All of you are getting the same grade. If you cannot get it together, you're going to get that F. And that brings the individual 
who, who wants to have their own way in alignment and they just abandon their own goal and they cooperate with the group for one common goal they want that age so in other words the circumstances or the challenges that the devil has brought about in your life to destroy or to discourage you god has a way of causing it to abandon its ultimate goal which is to destroy or to discourage you and cooperate with the work and work together with the purpose god has planned for your life so in the life of joseph god caused his circumstances of being hated and despised by his brothers to cooperate with the purpose God had for the life of Joseph. God caught Joseph pit experience to cooperate with the purpose God had for his life. God caused Joseph's prison experience to cooperate with the purpose God has for his life. The purpose God had for Joseph's life is found in Genesis 45 verse 5, which says, Now therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me thither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Genesis 50 and 20 says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as is this day, to save much people alive. Another witness who can give testament to the apostles' phrase, and we know, would be Moses. Those of us who are familiar with the life of Moses know that he experienced suffering, trials, affliction. In fact, the writer of Hebrew puts it this way in Hebrew chapter 24, verses 26. He says, it was faith that made Moses when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of the king's daughter. He, pre he preferred to suffer with God's people rather than to enjoy sin for a while. He reckoned that to suffer, scorn for the Messiah was worth far more than all the treasures of Egypt, for he kept his eyes on the future rewards. And as a result of God causing all things to work together for good in the life of Moses. God was able to accomplish his purpose of delivering the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. The final example of one who can join in with the apostle Paul in testifying that all things work together for good would be that of David. In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 12 through 16 we find these words, and I'm reading from the Good News Translation. This is God's message to David through the prophet Nathan. He says, when you die and is buried with your ancestors, I will make one of your sons king and will keep his kingdom strong. He will be the one to build a temple for me, and I will make sure that his dynasty continues forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him as a father punishes his son. But I will not withdraw my support from him as I did from Saul, whom I removed so that you could be king. You will always have descendants, and I will make your kingdom last forever. Your dynasty will never end. Here we see God's ultimate purpose for David was that through him, God would establish a kingdom that would last forever. And for those of us who knew the story of David's life, knew about his many sufferings that he had experienced at the hand of Saul and his enemies. It was Saul's ultimate goal through the working of a man to kill David to prevent this kingdom from being established. God promised David that his kingdom would last forever. And we know that Jesus Christ came through the lineage of David. 
So this promise was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. The life of David is a true testament that all things work together for good. The Bible is filled with many witnesses to this fact. And you can find it in the book of Hebrew chapter 11. As we continue with verse 28, we come to the phrase, all things work together for good. In this phrase, the first word that I notice is all. The Bible says all things work together for good. The word all means just that, all. It means the whole, every kind. So I can hear some of you in my spirit asking, does the loss of my job due to COVID-19 fit in this category? Does me working on reduced days and salary as a result of COVID-19 fit into this category? Does the death of my loved one fit into this category? Does my divorce fit into this category? Does the arrest of my good son fit into this category? Does the closure of my business fit into this category? Does the negative doctor's report fit into this category? The answer to all of your questions is a resounding yes. Paul says all things, all circumstances, events, tragedies, bads, and evil things, all are working together for a good. But if we want to keep this scripture in context, it refers to suffering, trials, tribulation, affliction, persecution. God, the omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent one has a way of causing every bad situation to work for good. That's the kind of God we serve. I know this is a word of encouragement to many of you who find yourselves in one of these situations. But that's not the end of the verse. There is a description of the people to whom this promise is extended to. I want to say it again. There is a description of the people to whom this promise is extended to. The first description is to them who love God. I can see some of you through my spiritual eyes in your home raising your hands and saying, that's me. Well, well, I love God. So that means me. I sing on the praise team or in the choir. I attend prayer meetings and Bible study. I assist in the outreach ministry and I assist on the evangelism team. Yes, you can do all of these things and still not love God. Jesus said to the people in Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name did we not drive out demons? and perform many miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, ye evildoers. In Romans 8, 28, the word for love is the Greek word agape. If you are a sinner or an unbeliever, you can never agape God. This is the love that God gives to his children. In John 14 and 15, we find these words of Jesus that says, if you love, if you agape me, keep my commands. The second description of the people to whom this promise of all things working together for good are the ones who are the called according to God's purpose. I want you to look at that person in your home or the person that's sitting by you and ask them this question. Are you the called according to his purpose? Let me explain what that means. Then you will be able to answer the question. 
The word for called is the Greek word kletos, which means divinely called. It means summoned by God to an office or to salvation. It means invited. The word call focuses on God's general call or invitation he gives to all people so that they can receive his salvation. So if you have accepted God's free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, you are the called. If that's you, you ought to give God some praise. Hallelujah. So the promises of assurance of Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, belong to born again believers. But can I tell you that God has a greater plan and purpose for the life of the believer? But right now, we have been occupied with this COVID-19 pandemic and its domino effect. The loss of lives of loved ones, the layoff of employees from various business establishes, the reduction of salary, and all other challenges that come along with it. We just want God to fix all that the devil has caused to go wrong right now in our lives. Yes, we want God to solve our problems and our issues now. And I, I promise you that God's got you. He is in control and nothing catches him by surprise. Look at your neighbor and tell him COVID-19 did not catch God by surprise. And I firmly believe that it will all work out. But can I tell you that the greater good and purpose of God for our lives is found in Romans 8, 29, verse 30. But most of us stop reading at verse 28. And we begin to throw a praise party at verse 28. But the celebration should start, and notice I said, the celebration should start at verse 29 and verse, 20, and verse 30, which reads, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren and those he predestined he also called those he called he justified those he justified he glorified so my brothers and sisters god's ultimate plan is that we be conformed to the image of his dear son. That's twofold. When others look at us, they should see Christ in the way that we live, in the things that we do, how we treat others. They should hear Christ in the words that we speak. Then the ultimate purpose is being glorified like Christ by God, our heavenly father for all eternity. So seeing the bigger picture, the Apostle Paul can end his praise party or his celebration with verses 31 through 38, which reads as follows. What then shall we say in response to these things? What then shall we say in response to these things, to the suffering that COVID-19 has caused all around the world. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who has raised to life, is at the right hand of God and also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Should COVID-19 separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship 
or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sort. And let me add, nothing, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in, in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So this morning, I would like to extend an invitation to those non-believers who have been listening and even watching this broadcast. And you now realize that the assurance in Romans 8.28 does not apply to your life because you have not accepted God's invitation of salvation. I invite you to bow your head in your home and repeat the words of this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before your presence confessing that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. You said in your words, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You said if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, I shall be saved. So Heavenly Father, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. I now invite Jesus into my heart. I thank you for saving me. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word of assurance. I pray that you will strengthen every believer to trust you in the midst of what they're going through. I pray that you will perfect everything concerning our nation. Continue to guide and direct those that govern us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I have a name for Jesus. A name that is my own. A name that I can call him whenever I'm alone. This name to me is special. So lovely and sublime. this time we invite Pastor Sharice to come at this time with the benediction and following the benediction our praise team will close us out with our benediction song let us look to the Lord and be dismissed now unto him that is able to keep you from falling 
and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Come on, sing, everyone. Say, I need you. Sing. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Come on, stand with me. Stand with me. And agree with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is His will. It is His will that every need be supplied. I need you. I need you to survive. Come on, you are. are important to me. I need you to survive. Come on, everyone together, say, I pray for you. Three parses, say. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't argue with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you. Say it again. Say, I pray for you. I pray. You pray for me. You pray for me. I love you. I love you. I need you to survive. And I won't have you. I won't. Oh! 